Hey, welcome back to the Lick of the Week videos. This is our seventh video in what I'm calling our redo series, where I'm going back to re-record some of the very first Lick of the Week videos I posted on the Hangout back in 2008. They were really bad quality, both in video and sound, so I'm, I'm light years beyond what I had then, so I thought it would be good just to re-record them to make them viewable. <laughs> Uh, this was posted toward the end of July in 2008, and it's probably the most commonly heard, or maybe not commonly heard, but the most recognized melodic lick probably of all time. I'm not sure the author of the lick. It could be Bill Keith, could be Bobby Thompson, uh, could be any of those uh, you know pioneering uh, melodic players, Courtney Johnson, Ben Eldridge, some of those guys. But once you hear the lick, if you listen to any melodic style banjo at all, you'll know exactly the lick I'm talking about. Let me play it for you. So there's the lick, and again, if you're familiar with melodic style banjo, I'm sure you've heard this lick. It's very famous, and if I'm not giving somebody proper credit, I apologize because I really don't remember where this lick came from. And theory-wise, this lick is actually operating out of a B-flat scale. It's called a B-flat pentatonic lick, and I don't want to get too deeply into the theory aspect of the lick, but it does help to know that the notes that you're playing here are actually coming, the majority of the notes are coming from a B-flat scale. Now, how does this lick function in the song? Well, this is another aspect you need to kind of wrap your head around. In this case, I'm playing in the key of G. I could play these notes in this lick. Again, I don't have to play the entire lick from one end to the other. I can stop at any point. I can break it up into fragments and make cool licks off of the fragments. But however I play these set of notes in whatever order I play them in, they could be functioning as blues over G. So if you listen to this, it could sound like something bluesy over G, which is one way you could... Uh, resolve this lick. In other words, make your ear find a resolution point. Your ear wants to know where you're going with these sounds. Where is this taking me? Your ear could say, oh, that's a blues lick because you make the listener hear what you want them to hear. You basically want them to hear a blues lick. But if you're playing a song, even in the key of G, in a B flat chord up here. So somewhere in the progression. said, oh, I need uh, some patterns that I can play to improv over the B-flat chord. Well, obviously these notes, they could be resolved, or you could make the listener say, oh, those notes belong to a B-flat chord. They really belong to either one. They could be blues over G, they could be a B-flat note, a uh, set of notes that are a B-flat lick. Again, it's up to you to resolve or to make the listener hear what you want them to hear at the very end of the lick. You have to resolve it to usually a, a note chord so their ear can go, oh, that's where that went. In this case, depending on how I resolve it, what note I'll let be the last note of the lick, I can automatically make you think that's a B-flat lick. But here's something interesting. Again, it's theoretical, so sorry for the theory, but I think it's useful. A B-flat scale also gives you the same notes as G minor. You've heard the term relative minor maybe. Every time you learn a major scale, there's a, a, a minor scale that's closely related to it. So G and E minor are related to each other. So when you learn a G major scale, whether you know it or not, you've already learned an E minor scale. It's just a different arrangement of the same notes. So that's why G and E minor are so closely related on the fingerboard on the banjo. And so many songs have G to E minor kind of sounds in them. So when you're playing this, what we're calling a G blues lick, if you're calling that a blues lick for G, uh, it's because B flat kind of relates to a G blues scale. And it also gives you that relative minor, G minor. So B flat is to G minor what G minor is to G blues, which is a lot, I know, to wrap your head around. But if you can just remember that, anytime you want multiple uses for the same scale, you have to know what context the scale is being played in. So am I using this as a blues lick for G? Am I playing around with these notes? Is that, 
is that going to be G blues I'm playing, or is is there a B flat chord that has appeared in the progression? And I need some notes that will give me something to play over B flat. and G minor are related. They're relative to each other. So then you could say, well, there's a G minor chord that actually appears in one of these songs. What am I going to play? What G minor licks will I come up with? Well, if you're a melodic player, you can say, okay, G minor, B flat are related. So I can use the same notes I just played for B flat. And they automatically function as G minor. Why? Because you do the guy or the girl playing the banjo, you make the listener decide what kind of lick that is by what chord maybe it's being played over. So if there's a G minor chord that appears in a song, you say I need a G minor lick, a G minor lick, and a B flat pentatonic lick, pretty much the same thing. Or if you want G blues, you just resolve it to a, say a G dominant seventh chord, good old G7. It's the B flat lick you're trying to express, you're trying to make somebody think these notes belong with B flat. Resolve them or play them over a B flat chord. So you get three uses for the same scale. Now let's look at the fingering. And this is a four note scale lick, which means in common time, four beats per measure, you'll be playing 32 notes per measure. And let me tell you, if you're playing this lick at say 150 beats a minute, that is a lot of notes to play in a measure. 32 notes in a measure at 150 beats a minute is a lot of notes. So this is going to take some pretty uh, good practical application skill. If you're not familiar with these kind of four note scales, you need to investigate those and maybe practice four note patterns before you attempt to do the full blown lick. Now I'm going to add this chromatic note. Again, the chromatic note is usually a note that doesn't belong in your scale pattern. So in this case, we're playing a B-flat pentatonic, which is five notes out of the B-flat scale as a lick. But I'm going to add this note. Normally I would play the B-flat scale pattern like this. With my ring finger on the fifth. But because I want to add this note, the eleventh fret of the fifth string, I'm going to use this note as my starting note, not this note. So we're going to start with this index here, middle here on the second and then ring on the first. So these two notes are on the same string, but one's canceling the other one out. Now I'm going to put my thumb here. There's my chromatic note. This note and this note are a half step apart. And we're going to do a backwards roll pattern. One, five, one, two, five, one, two, five, one, two, open five, one, five, two. So there's all the notes we're playing here. Groups of four. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, then we'll shift to the next position. But the notes are all contained in backwards rolls at this point. One, five, one, two, five, one, two, five, one, two, five, one, two, five, is what you'll play here. Now let me see if I can shift the camera over. Oops, wrong way. And then we're going to switch to this position, which again will be unorthodox if you're not used to playing these pentatonic scale patterns. Third string at five, second string at si uh, six, first string at eight. And these are the fingers that I choose. You can use what you like. And we're going to start forward rolls here. Two, one, five, two, one, open, five, two, one. Then three, two, one with the first open. So it's two, one, five. This note, this note stays the same. You need the four string at eight, and you're going to play this backwards roll. Three, four, one, three. Then open third. Here's where we're going to finish the lick out. Open third. Four string at three. Open third. And again, these licks can be broken up into all kinds of fragments. You can break it, hit it with a hammer, and come up with all kinds of cool pieces. But that's the basic lick and basically how you're using it when you're improvising. You can come up with your own ideas too. But have fun with the lick and we'll see you next time. Thanks.